Hello and welcome to This and That. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Beyer and I'm wearing earbuds, Dave. Maybe well, the solution to all our problems. You know, we actually have spent a lot of time on this. There's <laughs> microphones and games and all sorts of things. So Jonathan had Bluetooth earbuds and they were causing a problem. The computer wasn't recognizing them. So like, let's do this the old fashioned 2013 way. Exactly. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. So okay. Anyway, apologies for our uh, issues last week. And it works today. So moving on. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> we try. We try, people. Uh, we really do. All right. Let's start. There's been a lot of news. I'm just going to start with USA Gymnastics and then we'll get into skating. Go for so, it. Yeah. <laughs> also, side note um, we were going to have Doug Haw on. He had to um, withdraw at the last moment due to a head cold. He has offered to join us next week. So um, it is very singles focused today, but we were having a singles guru on. I talked to Doug yesterday and he was telling me that he fired his top student because the mother um, <laughs> was being very American and he had enough. <laughs> He said, you do not have a PhD in skating just because your daughter is nine. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I would think, think, like, let me do what I'm going to do, and you need to trust. trust. Yeah. I really respect that, when the mother starts becoming unhinged. Uh, yeah. Denial and Nip it in the, the bud. bud. Nip yeah. it in the bud. So yeah. I think when you've had, like, 17 coaching changes before you reach the novice level, that's an indication that there's something wrong. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, it's not, not the coaches. coaches. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, but he also... I'll say a little bit because he was at Brian or he runs a camp with Brian Orser. Um, he's coached Brian Orser. He's been uh, good friends with him for a long time. So he has seen a little bit of Medvedeva training and he said that she looks really great and they, they're trying to really encourage her to have her own voice. Sandra has brought out some of the sex appeal, uh, of the flirtation, you know, I don't know if sex appeal is the right word. The, She's becoming a woman, okay? Yeah, and She's yeah. eating healthily. There's no more Terry telling her to, you know, not eat for three days. And, yeah. and just flail. Yeah, okay. So she, they seem to be working on it, and I think she's going to do really well this year. I, I hope, hope so. so. <laughs> it's so funny because when I ask Sandra about her, she'll be like, I do my Sandra. You know, this year is a process. It's all about the long term. You know, well, and it must be annoying for all these people to for to have those expectations immediately. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's like we we barely just got to know her. So you know? it is true that this is about the long term, and it's also true that she's looking really good right now. So she's yeah. she's developing and she's on track. So yeah, let's she's see. taking her first step to a new journey. So and also when Orser took her on, Tarasova sent him a text that said that she had full confidence and full support of this coaching move, which is interesting and important That's huge. because we know Tatiana's word is. Well, yeah. <laughs> the stamp of <laughs> approval. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel very good about this. And as far as Jason Brown, I think we knew this from champs camp. There's no quad in the short there. There's a planned quad currently in the long, but unclear if they're, I'm clear if that will stay. They want to show progression. You know, right. Rick has a lot. Of, they have to keep him very healthy. So they have to, you know, balance uh, the right. situation. So, Jonathan, after seeing the JGP, I don't know about you. Do you think he should go for the quad? I given given that he can get these plus fives on other elements. I don't know. I would worry about cleaning up the other elements in the meantime. I think they should still work the quad out of the program, but for the Grand Prix, he may be able to get a couple of medals and maybe even make the final if he's clean, consistent with two strong. Because what what was happening at the at some point last season was that the steady jumps became unsteady. So if the plan was indeed to to rest on your laurels, that the things you do do you you do so well that you can get these plus GOEs, then they almost need to refocus on all that. Because like the let's um, the let's toe combo was getting really goofy for a while, and like a, a lot of the secondary jumps for him were problematic. So is it, does it behoove you to clean up everything and keep working on it? But I don't. I and I think a lot of it has to do mentally. I would think like again, if you go out and you know your first jump is going to be a bomb. This is what we were talking about with that Adam like approach if you're if you're almost planning to open with a mistake 
does that does that I don't know unhinge you in a way? I don't. Know. I like to give extra components to a clean program. I always think that it helps yeah. a little bit. Uh, yeah. The one thing I was thinking is that he already had very good skating skills. There were some areas where he could certainly improve in power and just over the ice. And if he's working with Tracy and you're taking someone who's already, let's say at an 8.5 or a nine, and you're then improving that, I think you could get a clean triple axel in the second half from Jason that we rarely ever see one that has, you know, plus GOE and the twos and threes. So I think that if he could get that rotated and clean and strong, that would be a great goal for the fall to really get the elements before it's added and if it's if if you're retooling a lot of ideas and a lot of things i think to take off an appropriate amount at a time is correct if suddenly everything was different every move choreographically every jump entrance every idea of technique is different i I don't know that in my opinion for me personally i don't know it would be the time to add a whole new element even though i know he's worked on it it's a new element you know and is he going to last four years? Is he going to be competitive four years? Is he going to be healthy? I'm not sure. So I think you have to pace that. And yeah. Work. I'm excited to see the long program. Yeah, that's supposed to be a stunner. So Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I did say that I was going to touch on USA Gymnastics. So I um, I called Christine Brennan the other day to make sure that she was uh, on, it. on it. And she was like, but Dave, that we have other gymnastics reporters. Is this something I need to be on? And I said, oh, oh yeah. yes, Christine. This is... Um, so I think it was Tuesday that I, um, I got out of work late. I didn't cook dinner. I went to the diner, had an omelet, drinking my coffee. And my friend Aaron uh, sends me a, a message that USA Gymnastics appointed Mary Lee Tracy as the developmental coordinator. That basically means that she's in charge of all the people that are underneath the national team. So that would be like, uh, you're novice and below and junior. I... When they're trying to re-culture, re- I left from shock for about 15 minutes. Like I it was such, such a bad, bad choice. choice. Such a bad... Just for Paint the picture of who she is. Is, is there a skating equivalent to who she is? Would it be like putting a Teary in charge of like nutritional development for children or something? Well, there are elements of that, but I don't think it's that bad or mean-spirited. But Okay. So Mary Lee was a cheerleader. She's been on the show. I think she, I always thought that she reminded me that she would be perfect for a Lifetime show because she's such a full-blown character that's ready for TV. She's well-spoken. She does have intelligence. Okay. I think that Mary Lee's downfall is that she's too controlling and anal. And over time, it looks like her, her gymnasts have started to look like that and get injured. She was really good in the 90s. And she seemed a little bit more um, happy, relaxed, young, carefree, vibrant. And then once the Carolis and Steve Nuno retired, everyone went to her. And I don't think she really had the technical skills yet. Okay. And she, but she became, she went from being that like happy coach on TV to the jaded, um, very serious, you're embarrassing me type coach very quickly. Uh, even We've seen that happen at skating. <laughs> yeah. She, like, she's admitted that, that that okay. happened. But she also loves the press, loves the media. She really loves teaching. She like actually will work with a lot of coaches and develop them, which is one of her better qualities. I think she's she's been known to have a lot of problems with weight and overtraining with the gymnasts in her gym. Oh, because like I was going to say, up until now, it actually like sounds like a great choice, but obviously we knew there was so much backlash that it was not a good choice. But so so, so take me there in gymnastics. You can always kind of tell when someone is. Um, that they're eating problems from gym when a gym repeatedly sends girls to college and they gain like 20 to 30 pounds in their freshman year and then have to retire because their body can't adjust to the gain. Regular life. Yeah. She, that happened with one of her, at least a couple of her gymnasts and they had back okay. problems as well. Another one of her gymnasts was at Georgia and Suzanne would publicly state that she needed to gain more weight before she would allow her to compete. So there's mm. a lot of like control things going on. Okay. And there was the whole thing that after Larry Nasser came out and 50 people had already reported that they'd been abused by Larry Nasser, she publicly said to the press that he was like a brother, he's been so great for her athletes, and they really supported him. Now, that's problematic for a couple of reasons. And to me, Mary Lee Tracy, I know you don't work in corporate America, but she reminds me of someone 
who takes the party line and is so politically motivated about doing the right thing and maybe has gotten ahead not on brute knowledge or talent, but, like, she plays the game really well. Yeah. She plays, and she believes that that is the right thing to do, to be behind the leader, behind the system. So, but at a certain point, there's, like, an integrity issue when all of a sudden this becomes... Things are changing. Thing, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, there's that. So... By the time that 50 people were already there, and if you were a coach and he gets fired in 2015, by the time this comes out in 2016, you would have heard and known about this right. and how, especially when all of these coaches talk and gossip and are at the ranch and are starting, you would have had a pretty good idea and you would have known by that point. Now she's like, he fooled us all. We were all manipulated by him. You could argue that, right? And if it were an isolated incident. However, Jonathan, <laughs> this was funny to me for several reasons. So, a couple summers ago, Miss Val from UCLA encouraged me. She said, you know, I was talking to her and I said that it was really funny to me how NBC was doing all of these legendary documentaries on the Corollis and only looking at one side of things. And she was like, well, I think you should look into that. So I just interviewed different gymnasts and people for something I was working on, and I, w I wanted just to get an overarching view of them, the good, the positive, the genius, the bad, the ugly, and, and get like right. a wide range of views. So one of the people that I talked to was Alyssa Beckerman, but she started talking a lot about Mary Lee, and we started talking about this coach they had at their gym named Steve Elliott, who was... Um, caught being a peeping Tom of some one of the gymnasts at their home. At, at their, their home? Like, stole a ladder from the gym, looked at the skylight, and and when Alyssa was at the gym as a gymnast. And that was Mary Lee's assistant. But she fired him, but she didn't report him. So he went to another gym and then abused more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so that's she just made it someone, someone else's problem. problem. Yeah. Yes. And of course, she probably did that because she didn't want to get the negative attention or look bad. And then there was a situation where all the like USA Gymnastics came and investigated their gym for eating disorders. And there were just like, a lot of problems. She's had three coaches work at the gym that have been banned. So Jonathan, like this is a situation where like there's a CEO who's come in who knows nothing about any of the backstory of these people. And she mm -hmm. keeps putting in people where it's like wrong move after wrong move. And it looks right. like they're now going to fire her this week. That looks to be the next situation. Well, why on earth would you have hired her to begin with? I don't know. But the reason, because she looks so developmental and she's been around for so long and she's so of the system. And I think Shannon Miller is advising the CEO is what we've learned. And that's okay. a whole other can of worms. Um, okay. But... I think the interesting thing is that she's getting fired because Allie Raisman has said they won't talk to us, Mary Lee victim shamed, and Mary Lee, talk about playing the system, when the ranch was closed, she posted on her public Facebook about how this has been a great place of learning for 30 years, and it's so, or 25 years, and it's so sad that it's being closed. It was also like the house of abuse, you know. Right, a, a chamber, chamber of horrors for most, most. Yeah. yeah. And like when each of these people are getting fired for like things, Mary Lee kind of takes the wrong approach where she's still so ingrained of like party line that she's like, well, this is awful that Valeria's being fired. And this is awful right. that Rhonda's being fired. And it's like, well, you're kind of taking the wrong system. Side of things here. Yeah. yeah. And someone else from USA Gymnastics posted yesterday who was like Marta's henchwoman for, and boss for a long time said, how do we stop the negative publicity of Me Too and Ali Raisman and these victims giving us negative gymnastics? By correcting it properly, yeah, not by repeating all the same mistakes, yeah. So Mary Lee, who is great at the press and damage control, reached out to Allie, which is actually what she's officially fired for and not all of these other things that could have come out. But Allie's suing them, and Mary Lee reached out, like, out of turn, and this is what she's so... It's a cluster mess. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But on positive news, let's move on to skating, which is just so less messy. Um, yeah, or is it? <laughs> but we got good news. So Hanyu announced his program news this week. Um, he's skating Otonio. Uh, 
by Raul de Blasio for his short program. That was the music that Maria Petruskaya used in Nagano. It's the music that Johnny Weir used. It's a tribute to Johnny Weir. And he's skating Origin for his free skate. Uh, it's a tribute to Plashenko, which is the music that he used for tribute to Nijinsky. So he's really um, emphasizing Tributizing everywhere. <laughs> he's two like skating idols. He's doing this season for him. And we saw okay. some clips of him doing quad toe, quad sal. They both looked about plus four, plus five. Um, what do you think of these music choices? Um, I mean, I'll be intrigued. It's interesting that those are the two he's chosen to create the tribute for. You know, we knew because of this, these wardrobe nods that there was an interest in Johnny Weir. Which is interesting because then also Costa Naya came out for one of her programs um, in Linz. And I was like, this looks like a Hanyu uh, Johnny Weir mashup from the waist up. <laughs> Arguably also from the waist down. But so, um, <clears throat> it and the Plashenko bit surprises me. It surprises me that a skater like Hanyu is like, you know what I'm going to do? A tribute to Yevgeny Plashenko. And so I'm intrigued what motivated that. I'm sure there are many interviews that speak to it. But I'll be intrigued what, what inspired this. So it's interesting because he said that he idolized both of them for a long time. And I think that that's why... There are so many Hanyu, Plashenko, and even Johnny Weir, like, overtones and, right. like, emphasis in that, um, in, in the anime show. Oh, my goodness, I'm blanking. Uh, uh, Yuri on Ice. Yuri on Ice. Yeah. So you yeah. see that. Like, it's really kind of like him being coached by Plashenko. So... I but that's what, but I'm intrigued by, um, you know, sometimes they talk about like a skater's skater, somebody like Jeremy, somebody like Patrick, somebody like Dice Gate. To me, these were skaters, skaters, you know, actual skaters would come to watch them and like be like, holy cow, look at that. But the Plashenko thing is a phenomenon to me because in some ways I always thought there was a part of it, despite the technical ability, kind of, that it was a bit smoke and mirrors. So I see it. But not from a skating point of view, necessarily. From a showman point of view, more showman so? Showman point of view, and also that competitive fire, that competitive willingness, desire to be great, and the mental strength. Because uh, Plushenko is someone who believes he should be two or three-time Olympic champion, and how right. are you someone who's actually done it? And they both have longevity and those performances. So I can kind of see it, where they're both legends, and... Hanyu. But it's such different ways that I'm surprised there's any connection. Well, I, I see it in in that yeah. just that inner ability to put yourself out there and want to win. I mean, Hanyu has no reason to keep skating, and yet he is keep going, and he has that fire, right. and he looks great. So I'm curious. The Otonio piece, and I always didn't wasn't sure if it was Otonal, Otonio. I thought it was Otonio, but because of that Enye. But oh, anyway. That piece of music people have always laughed about because it oh the recording of it that de Blasio did always sounds like it was recorded off of TV with like a cassette recorder. Like it always sounds kind of blurry. And yeah, like, like slowed slow down, down track. track. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And just like staticky. So yeah. I'm really curious to see what which, which recording he actually uses. It reminds okay. me of like it's 1991 and we're watching someone's like Aretha Franklin funeral and like you're a kid and recorded someone on cassette tape when they're. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, or like even on YouTube when it's people holding up their phone. This was happening with some of the Sochi Olympic footage because like the Olympic programs were under such copyright laws for so, much, for so long. So that it was just like people holding their phone in front of an actual video on their television and then they would upload it. It had that kind of quality. Or yeah. a video last week. So it's okay. <laughs> I mean, it happens. <laughs> but anyway, I'm really curious to see what he does. I've always kind of liked the atonial music, even even though people laugh about it because it's so Johnny Weir dramatic and Maria Butruskaya dramatic, but I have always kind of liked it. So it would be a fun thing to see how you do. Yeah, I want to see some how you drama this season. He fun. doesn't. He was doing footwork, or it looked like his choreographic sequence during the point where like Plushenko did all of the arm flailing, like da -da 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 and um, whatever that is musically. Anyway, it looked interesting. I was. I'm. I'm. 
I'm here for it. I want to I'm see here for it. it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> It'll be something different. I, I feel like we haven't seen that exact kind of thing from him. So that tribute just extended Johnny Weir's show career for another three years. I'm telling you. I know, exactly. You're, You're welcome, welcome, Johnny. Yes. <laughs> well, let's start because I know it's going to just waft over me. Jonathan, we got to see your girl this week. Let's hear about it. Post your okay. Naya on the Junior Grand Prix. Okay, so here's here's where I need it done, but I'll I'll ask you too because you know the things. Um, I obviously I so enjoyed this girl for her ability, and even in my opinion, when she's given second-rate material, she makes it look even better than arguably the choreography deserves. Um, and we were talking a little bit about her jumps and I was trying to really hone in on the jumps. There's you've mentioned a leg wrap. It's a slight leg wrap. It's not it's a, a slight leg wrap. leg wrap, but it's kind of like here and we'll talk about it with Camden. So I'm, yeah. I'm looking at like the legs if they're upside down. It, it kind of is like here-ish. This is like the leg that's going a little, you know, yeah. where yeah. you really want them to be like this. Like Han Yu, when you watch Han Yu jump, his legs are like this. You know, yeah. And it's well, I liked when Doug was talking toe to toe. Yeah. To, you know what I mean? This kind of idea. And but for me, the more thing that takes me out of the moment is the picking. It's the picking on the flip, which is bad. yeah. It's a real like, and so it's when just you, when you pick with a full leg, right? You vault higher, actually. Like the good technique, it doesn't just look better. It actually bring. It should transfer weight and bring the skater up higher and straighter right it's actually it kind of shows you that she's jumping a little bit with her upper body as much as she is with her legs um but she it's not like her jumping technique i was looking at it it's not awful it's actually no like, no no no. and it's not I, but i think as as someone who like i really enjoy watching i'm trying to like really fine tune what i'm just seeing be even better it's yeah like i would say like she jumps very well and the reason i think she jumps so well is that she's got a lot of power, she's got a lot of good skating skills that she's going into the jump with. She's also more muscular and strong, just physically yeah. throughout her body. She's got abs, she's got arms, Core. she's got legs, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I think you see there's more of an edge quality. I think a lot of the complaints about Sherbakova is that she's alarmingly slight. And right. it doesn't look like that's the case. But yeah. Well, and it looks like her slightness is what's making some of these physical feats possible, whereas Costa and I is using strength to And she also has a great axle technique, which looks like it was I love learned. it. I love it. And she was getting plus fours across uh, the board on a double axle, which you rarely ever see, but she got plus four from almost every single judge there. But the entrances in were these kinds of entrances, you know, um, Jason Brown, when he was having real issues with the axle, one of the seasons was the, the entrance into it was so complicated and such a unique, difficult transition that you were so interested in it, but it, the jump never worked. So therefore the transition was kind of all for naught. But with her, she really does do some like fascinating stuff and the and the one blade work in between some of them. Like now I'm curious as we look at the new rules and we talk about transitions out of jumps. Because she does have a, a good flow on some of the jump exits and other jump exits are briefly she does you know so the she stag does. jump was really awkward because she also hits a weird position. I wrote down She's so talented, and it's so impressive what they're yeah. trying to do. And but they're trying to almost, you know do these combinations. And what's so funny is that she does this double axel to a stag jump, and it's obviously supposed to be here. And she's kind of like this, and it well, looks like she's going it's on. like that in both programs. She does it both times, and both times I was like, I wonder if this is. It was the same camera angle for both, and I was like, I wonder if we're supposed to see this from a different angle, and it's an, actually a variation, or if it's really just supposed to be what we think it's supposed to be, and it's just not quite being achieved. Whatever it is, it's not aesthetically wonderful, and yeah. as wonderful as she's capable of, which we've seen. And to me, it kind of looks like when you're going off of a diving board as a kid and you're trying all different can opener <laughs> positions and <Yeah>. dive positions. <laughs> and, um, but that's something that that's Danny's job or Terry's job to fix. They should be seeing that. Because she can fix it. Yeah. But she has to be 
Gaia. It, I mean, even in the very beginning of the bird fluttering sounds program, um, in the beginning, they try to give her all this, and she takes her time a little bit, even though they're still trying to rush her, and she's she fighting. Put too many positions in, in the opening yeah. part of the choreography, and she can actually hold moments, and she can hold it longer. What She has the most beautiful, aesthetically eyes, just, just a random note, superficially, they're beautiful, they're expressive, and she feels music. And it's her natural deportment also, also just, just the general way in which I believe she sits at a table and reaches for a napkin is undoubtedly elegant. It was elegant? You know yeah. What were you going to say? It's elegant and it's strong, and I view her as being very on track. Like, mm -hmm. you don't need to win junior this year. No one is going to remember that or really, I mean, people... Some annoying people will, of course, remember when you won the Junior Grand Prix event in Linz um, right. in, uh, <laughs> in 2018. But she, for long term, it looks like she's really on track. I just think that inevitably, Zagitova, Sherbakova, Trusova, and um, Kosternaya cannot all last with the Terry and be trying to be the number one skater in the world. That will not hold. So she's someone that I would love to spend three months in the summer working with Frank Carroll, working with Brian Orser, or working with a choreographer and a coach who can really just take what she has and enhance A Tom her. Dixon, a Sandra, a Shea, even a Shay, or like anybody, Shay Lynn rather, like anybody who can just find what she has and bring it out instead of assign her, her version of the same thing everyone else is doing. It reminds me of, did you ever do Mongolian barbecue? No. Or like um, those like fancy stir fry places yeah. where you go and pick all the raw ingredients and then they are cooking it for you. It and every time you put in too much of this and that, yeah. And that's my point. That's what these Danny G programs are because I'm not. I'm no longer picking things that are subtle and go well together. I literally just see every ingredient I like and I just put it in. And then the the end is like a messy, unorganized, just show all your cards all at once kind of thing. And that's that's basically and she almost is nobly and valiantly like fighting it. Yeah. She's like you're giving me this clutter and I'm trying to finish it. But there are some limitations just based on how much she has to do. Do you ever see those videos on YouTube or Instagram where a Terry's girls are in the dance class and they're doing all of the weird movements mm -hmm. and they look fun and cheeky. But you think like, if you could just spend that time with this girl on ballet right. and just classical movement, she would be the number one skater in the world right now at yeah. this level. Like she would really be competing for the best because she has it. She has so much strength, musicality, and Sherbakova has a, has a lot of qualities, so does Trusova, and so does Medvedeva. I just think if you put them in ballet and just work on the work on the science of movement, of position, right. you would get... Deportment. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you would have programs we would go back to and watch all the time. Yeah. Because it brings us back to that young ballerina era of skating. And it's, the materials are in front of us. They're just not being utilized. They're listening to bird sounds and honking horns and gusts of wind and pantomime instead, you know, but they have such ability. Now, here's an embarrassing question. <laughs> here's a skating idiot question. She keeps doing this like Beelman variation and it's, it's not or like a catch foot spin situation, hair cutter almost. And she's not quite getting to a thing. And it, it reminds me of that jump after the, I think it's the jump kept being after the double axle. Yeah. And it, my question is, are you, is this what you're intending? She probably is. It's probably or are you missing a final something that needs to be adjusted? It's probably a poorly executed hair cutter. You know, I think. Yeah. It, it's something about it seems incomplete. Of course, I'm probably getting it wrong because I have, I'm not, I didn't know in advance which thing we were talking about. And I know, I know, I know, Dave, and I'm sorry. But, okay, everybody else in the comments, yes. <laughs> if you can't yell about the audio, maybe you can go back and look at her spin and let us know what you think. Because I she... I have detailed it, notes, by the way. So, anyway... Yeah, see, I got my little ones. Okay. Um, but I... I, I I'd be intrigued what happens. And now talk to me. Are we still giving points for the transitions out of jumps? Yes. And how do you feel about that? Well, it's supposed to be done in 
for things that highlight music or things that highlight the jump. And of course, in Terry's Girls do it on every element. And of course, Tom Skaggs will try to do that. But here's the thing. So, so yeah, yeah, some, some of the three, three jump combos, combos especially, we've, we've lost so much speed at the end that like the transition out is literally like a dead stop and she turns and pushes away, you know. So here are some of my notes. Um, I really love when she does her spiral into the triple loop in the long. So she mm -hmm. uses her arm to get up into the position, but then she lets it go and she holds it. And it stays there and then she goes into the triple loop. So... I thought that that was um, really a lovely moment. But then the triple loop could have been a little better on the landing. But she did get plus two to plus five for it. Note, she did get an exclamation point on her Lutz. Um, and then I just keep writing Danny G. All right. So she does three different versions of Romeo and Juliet that are in here. Um and then, but yet the same, the, the same old basic just stand water, water thing. We're going to start with a time for us. We're going to sprinkle in kissing you. There's going to be some dialogue. Like So the dialogue, I actually would have lasted longer and then used the second piece if they wanted to use two different, you know, pieces of music and just had it go longer. This is such a cheap music edit because we go from the more modern piece that... Um, I forget who actually did the Romeo and Juliet. Uh, with the kissing you? No, the yes. second. Oh. It's the second Romeo and Juliet piece. It's the same composer that the French have used and that Medvedeva has used before. Uh, oh, it's Hawaii and Baker used it. They used it uh, the year after they did Amelie. They used this music. Um, a time for us. That's no, not the time for us. The piece of music that is. Um, it sounds like generic loveliness, and it's the second piece of music that she uses right after the dialogue. And oh, it's with Romeo and Juliet that it's like lovely yoga music. Like it's okay, really just okay. like, but it would have been fine or use a time for us, which is kind of more of the costume that we're going for. Cause it looks very Halloween-ish. Um, it's just like, the on pure waist. It's like, even unflattering. And you're like, what is happening? Why did you buy this out of a bag at a Toys R Us going out of business sale? Yes. Um, and I thought it was funny that her components were higher in the long than the short because I thought the short was the better program. I, I think so, so too. Also, but the whole thing is like Costa and I Sleeping Beauty, no problem. Why can't you do the Prokofiev? Why can't you do the Tchaikovsky? I'm not just saying that because I'm a classical musician. I'm just saying this is a classical skater. Give her that. Give her the quality music that she needs. Other skaters can't pull off something big and balladic, and she could, so... If you wanted to do Romeo and Juliet, I don't understand why you wouldn't have done those. So there were two Russian-y, um, Eastern European sounding um, callers here. And I thought it was just funny. And some of the judging was interesting now that we have plus five. Like, aberrant judging really um, stands out more. When you're seeing even her triple sow, triple toe combination in the second half was not a great landed. It was not great landing. It actually looked like it was rotation in real time. It looked possible that it was around. Um, but a weak landing, and it got zero to plus three. Clearly not a plus three. There right. were worse versions, uh, you know, examples of this in the pairs that Megan Duhamel was discussing. With, with the, the French, French pair, pair, right? Yeah, okay. okay. But I really noticed oh. it with the next skater, Elena Kanishova, who is lovely, by the way, even more lovely than Kostanaya in terms of her, her overall positions. She's clearly had a lot of ballet training. Are you talking about Kanishova? Who are you Kanishova, about? yeah. Okay. okay. Now, her issue is that she has absolutely horrific music choices that have nothing to do with anything. And her short program is called The Show Must Go On, and it starts with Moonlight Sonata. I thought that, too, as they were announcing it. I was like, well, that's... But it, it was like... The, the thing was very strange. <laughs> no, it was Russian, and it was like someone died, and the show must go on. Whatever. It was... Yeah, exactly. It was like a Tolstoy novel. But um, it was... Um, I thought that she just needs a little bit more expression because she has everything. I'm worried she's going to be like Victoria Volchkova tall because she's 13 and she looks like there's some long limbs going on that could be too tall. Okay. But okay. overall, her vehicle of the, like, she is so, she has good technique. She's got so many wonderful qualities. And I just and this is one of the non teary camps that I'm less familiar with. Yes. I don't know much about this school, but yet enough of it was different that it was like a breath of fresh air because it wasn't as formulaic 
from she the also outer. had really beautiful eyes. And I was like, are the Russians now picking people based on their eyes? Are we <laughs> On their so far. Like she, and, but especially in the long, I was like, oh, you look like a teeny tiny little baby. Um, but she's... Now, have you ever done... I know you do yoga and things like that. There's also these schools of movement like Alexander Technique and Feldenkrais and this sort of stuff, this like body awareness movement that a lot of um, musicians will do. And it ta- Alexander Technique is very based on the skull resting on, like, the spine here. I'm going to get a little bit wrong. And the rest hangs. But, like, the center is here and everything hangs down. And, like, the arms hang and all this sort of stuff. Then Feldenkrais is this idea that your everything is, starts and emanates from the hips. Okay. And, like, pelvic floor and this kind of thing. And what I got when she was skating was I got such an emphasis up here. I felt like all of her movement was generating from this area and not as much from her core and from like her pelvic floor and hips and things like that. And I kind of missed that. It, it kind of made me feel unsettled. Like she wasn't as anchored in her body. She and I think it's rod straight up her spine. Is what you're yeah. Saying. Yeah. And, and somehow like the source of her performance energy and movement all generated from up here and not from her hips to my she eyes. She uses, that's interesting because she actually uses her legs and she shows some ice dancery low movement, especially in her step okay. sequence. She okay. actually has some really nice steps and edge quality that's even better than Coaster Naya at some times because of what Danny is giving Coaster Naya. This right. girl was doing some like knee slide movement. It changed plane and it was interesting. It was more right. um, interesting like steps that she put together, but it's not always performed as well as it could be and that may be something but it made me it seemed like you know when i watched coaster and i obviously i forget i'm watching a fucking or, oh my gosh i'm so sorry i'm so sorry about that no i'm so sorry <laughs> i forget i'm watching a flipping junior grand prix event like it blows my mind we could be watching you know Skate America, that program could have potentially won. You know what I mean? Like it was so impressive. And when I when I saw Elena number two, um, it was like things are right on track. All the ingredients are there and they're being cultivated. And now you see just where with time things will start to fill in. Like her opening spiral mm-hmm. in the one program. It was a beautiful position. Yeah, you know how sometimes if you're ever doing like Pilates or something, they're like, don't let your legs just fall out of the air. You're supposed to be controlling how they go down. She kind of like hurls her body weight into the position and then holds the position. It's a beautiful position, but like she kind of like just threw her body into it. And that kind of stuff, you know, oh, well, the position is great. And with time, everything will... Those kinds of things, if they're paid attention to, will fill right in. So I feel very confident that she will mature into a skater I will enjoy watching as well. So a little notes on her free program, Dreams of a Winter Journey, which is such a Maria Butruskaya. Uh, <laughs> yes, kind of journey <laughs> to have. <laughs> um, very nice triple lutz, Euler triple sow cow, by the way, in the second half. I wrote down the Euler so that I'll remember it and keep saying it mm-hmm. and won't say mm-hmm. what else it is because then people will be like, it's not a half loop, it's an Euler. So, <laughs> like like Megan. <laughs> Euler. Okay. However, the triple flip, double toe, lovely girl, lovely skater, in this instance, clearly an under-rotated triple flip. Yeah. And Marta Senra and Elena S. on the, t- the technical specialist did not call this. And I thought that that was um, a little bit strange that we have to get um, political on the Junior Grand Prix. She was clearly going to medal, clearly going right. to win. Just, it was just something to note. And the yeah. judges went minus two to plus two. I'm sorry, there's no way to give that a plus two when it was a clearly an under-rotated jump with a weak landing. And I just right. thought that it was really, like, are we really? Right. You need to boost someone up on the Junior Grand Prix. They were clearly going to go one, two. They were in no danger of ever right. losing to the girl. From but now, is in this world of quantifying scores and all this sort of stuff, is it literally about reaching a number? I don't know. Do they think that for some reason, if she posts a certain number, even though we know numbers between competitions, you know, they're less applicable but are they trying to make sure she came above the russian girl who was two last week in bratislava you know who knows yeah i mean okay it was just shady or incompetent and i'm not sure which one but 
Because Junior Grand Prix is also based on placements, not scores. So you could be second by a mile, and you're still getting the same amount of qualifying points as, as someone who was much closer to first but still ended up second. So who knows? And she does the interesting thing when her arms are over, you know, like um, – this was, um, oh my gosh, I forgot her name. My girl, Maria Sotskova, you know, and there's the variations. She does these intense fists yeah. when she when she throws them over her head. They're pretty low, but like it looks like she's going to come out of the jump and just like punch somebody. <laughs> it was an interesting variation. So. Um, so I have notes, a couple of notes on the Japanese girl who I don't think we need to spend much time on because she didn't leave much of an impact. Um, yeah, this one, she came from, you know, the not Hamada school, maybe. Shika, Yoshida, uh, lots of, nice air position, uh, with the legs, not a lot of height on the jumps. Everything was fine. But she covered some distance in the long. The short was a little scrappier, but. The short, I just wrote, um. I wrote that her music choice, it sounded like a song in a musical where we are injecting plot to move the plot along. There was far too much... Oh, that was Matilda. That was Matilda. And it was one of those days, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes this happens. I was watching and I was like, after I got like the first 30 seconds of that particular short program, I was like, I'm really sorry. I'm going to go ahead and just watch the slow-mos. Horrific. Yeah, that was a tough one. Terrible costume. I didn't really like the version of the movie version that had the girl, the young girl from uh, Mrs. Doubtfire and um, Danny and Rhea. <laughs> didn't really yeah, enjoy that. Uh-huh. Don't think I'll be buying tickets to the musical. Don't know if it's still out there. Don't really yeah. care. Lovely book by Roald Dahl. Okay. It Just, is. It is. Yeah. Great book. Great film. Yeah. <laughs> it looked like she had a bedazzled version of Jenny's Pocahontas um, dress for the Free State. Um, yeah. I, I assumed it was going to be Pocahontas. Jenny said, I would never wear that dress. Well, um, you did, honey. Okay, yeah. so... But, but she had a glitzed up version of it, and it was for more thematic material, but... Anyway, we can move on. I don't... Yep. Let's not cut them while they're down. Um, let, okay, so this was interesting because Hyun Lee is coached by Yuna Kim's, uh, one of her coaches from Korea, and you could so see elements of Yuna, even in the, like, the choice of her sit-spin position or the cross positions that she did and some of the technique and the quality. And she had instances where you could see that she has a lot of potential that has not yet quite found its way. Yeah. Yeah. Found its way. She could have a little bit more personality. I actually didn't find that the, the Never Be Enough short program, which contemporary singer, I didn't think it was... I thought it was age appropriate because what do you do with some of these junior grand prix girls after a while? Right. Um, Anything but big spender, please. Yeah. <laughs> but she had a nice triple lutz, triple toe, and she she had really nice skating skills, really nice knee bend. She can hit gorgeous positions, and I, I wrote that you can really see the unit positions or the coaching in the just the choices of features. And thank you, Dave, for bringing that down to actual elements that the same coach is clearly teaching in its style and not merely making the comparison because they're both from Korea. <laughs> yes. No, I'm serious. I yeah, mean, sir, yours, yours makes logistical sense to me. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I thought that she had really nice triple lush, triple flip in the long. Um but I have to, I went on a really long tangent in my notes for the free program. It really upset me. Okay. She performed what I would like to call a misogynistic West Side Story, where how come we have this young ingenue from Korea and female, right? And maybe it's just because I'm listening to a podcast called Fatal Voyage, which is about Natalie Wood's death. Um, spoiler alert, don't trust Robert Wagner. Anyway, um... <laughs> Did you, you say, say Robin Wagner? Wagner? No. <laughs> I see what you did there. Um, why are we using all of the male parts when we have this young, beautiful, young spirit from Korea? Um, I just thought that it was a strange um, artistic choice when you have so many things that you could do about a young girl finding love, getting dressed up with I Feel Pretty, if you want to do a medley mashup, or... But why are we using all of, like, da da Like, it shouldn't have the same musical edit as Camden Polkinen. It's right. clearly the female 
point of view of West Side Story, and why are we using none of the female songs? Well, well because, because you, the, it's what you just mentioned, point of view. And does one have a point of view, or is one just listening to the music and dancing? So uh, I, I mean, think the, the best part, in my opinion, the most phenomenal music to dance to, skate to, in that entire musical is the mambo. And very few people use it. We keep listening to a lot of Maria's, Somewhere's, and then this opening sharks and jets, like, kind of riff music. So this girl looks like she's really at the point in her development where she should be using Tomorrow Somewhere's. Like, that just looks like where she's at, and you could interject a little bit of that in the footwork or something. It, does, it looks like she's learning, you know, how to be interpretive and different, and, and I feel like they could have put something, you know, whether the footwork would be to the mambo or I feel pretty or whatever. But I just felt like this was such a mishmash, and then how strange to see a skater from Korea, you know, busting it out for 15 seconds for no reason to I want to live in America. Like, just... Strange to me, you know. Like I just. Oh, well, you know, even in even in um, certain worlds of opera and musical theater, when they do those overtures, like some of the greatest, like Mozart overtures, it, it's not like what we associate today, where it's like a weird medley of everything you're about to hear. You know what I mean? Like I've always thought that was funny. You sit down at a musical. Why are you giving me all the highlights and the best of in the first three minutes? Very Rodgers and Hammerstein. You know? Yeah, it's it's. But even their stuff often like introduce other music and then other stuff would come in with it. But that's how I view these programs. It's like it's like you don't have to give me a book report of the movie and use a little bit of every song and a little bit of all this stuff. Just do something that you want to share from it. You know what I mean? Like. Well, Alex um, Chang did it, and wasn't that the coach of Courtney Hicks? I'm just saying. Um, right. Let's... Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing I wonder is because I have to remember sometimes that we are watching a Junior Grand Prix. Notice I did not use the F word this time, but I meant it actually because it's what they're achieving is so remarkable. So many of them that you legitimately forget you're watching a junior event. Um, I'm intrigued how they develop artistic voices this way. Because if you have a student who's 13, 14, and you see big, big, big potential, like, you know, this is on a different trajectory. We're not here to win the medal at the Junior Grand Prix. We're here to lay the groundwork to win an Olympic medal in four years or whatever. Um, do you give them things that are easy for them to interpret and resonate so they understand that connection? Or do you continue to get them to go outside of the box so they're always doing new so you can keep exploring? Because sometimes it's like you feel like, yes, it was just an assignment, but at some ages it has to be an assignment. Or is it like when um, Zach and Maddie were able to do the hallelujah and we're like, oh, they, they resonate with this, so let's do more of this so they hone in on that feeling of, you know, feeling a piece, and then we'll be able to apply that to other pieces in different styles later. I don't know. I don't like think you, Scott Brown and Alex Chang were really um, thinking about Thinking of trajectory. trajectory. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, clearly these coaches, Atiri is not grooming Kostanaya for this weekend in Linz. She also knows, well, this is an unusual example, I guess, but um, they know that it has to, there's a big picture, that, a big track that they're on. So I'm intrigued how each competition and each program serves the big picture goal. Yeah. Um, another choreographer that I would put um, under the not serving a long-term goal, Derek <laughs> Delmore for Tinkui. I mean. Yeah. And another gift to a choreographer. She has, she, there's a, there's an aura about her that is delightful. Afternoon of a fawny, like kind of, effervescent kind of thing and so he wasn't completely wrong when he used like rhapsody with theme of paganini but he's mm -hmm. just not um at her level um in terms of what they should be doing that was actually um the far better program uh yes. i thought it was interesting level two step sequence uh, she doesn't get a lot of knee bend even though she's a tall beautiful they really have to work on the knee bend the big Paulina-esque at times, some of those kinds of um, similar issues with certain spins also, you know, and there's just kind of, it's a giraffe girl kind of situation. Yes. And that's hard on her jumps, and they really have to work on that with the takeoffs, and we could see that in Instagram videos last year that her old coach used to post. But 
Interesting, her parents said that it's very interesting that she always falls apart in the free skate because he said that at the World Arena, there are far too many skaters on the ice and they're never able to skate their uh, free skate with full power because it's just too crowded and they always kind of give it like 70% or so. And you can really see it. And that's yeah, that simulation is important. Like even when Megan was talking about going back to a six-minute warm-up and stuff like that, you would think you'd want to recreate the exact circumstances as much as possible, including the music. You know, all this thing, like, it blows my mind that they have to be reminded to listen to the music. But I was like, how often is someone like Ting, like, at the World Arena, just having to practice on her own in a small patch of ice without her music? Yeah. You know, it, it's, it seems like a scrappy way to put it together. Um, I just said that the, choreogra the choreography is not as advanced as she is. Um, she has some really nice things. Um, she got an E on the Lutz, and it was a negative five because of yeah. the... That was... Um, yeah. That seems harsh, doesn't it? Well, when you see a minus five, you're like, oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. you're like, what a mess that must have been. Wow, that <laughs> the worst hard. it could have gone. <laughs> but I, I thought it was interesting. For someone like Tom, who loves points, right? She got a 26 for components, and they looked like they were fair scores. And I just thought, hmm, four points right there that she really lost in components. If she had four more points and looked at what Coaster Naya was getting... That would have put her in third, yeah. you know, in the sh even with the mistakes. So even though he focuses on jumps for points, components also need to be addressed to getting these points. And I know that they're working on the dance classes and movement classes at the World Arena, this academy. Maybe they need to build a third ice surface for just the top elite skaters. So that they and maybe they only go there at certain points, points you yeah. know what I mean? Like, like for just for competition, competition simulation. simulation. Get, get together your six girls and go throw them on the ice together and simulate a competition. That seems like such an easy thing to do. And with so much of... And they have the arena right across the parking lot where they could... That's what I'm saying. And, and they have... Since mental um, preparation is, is such a factor for North American skaters, it would seem, the normalization of that whole kind of process would make it easier, you know? And the lawn was disastrous and it was the costume was just blending into the ice and it was just all it was not a great skate was, but much but she's um you know i know she struggles with ups and downs but uh, but there's something very lovely about her skating also randomly the former uh, russian girl who's skating for france had like a couple of Nice moments for me. It's kind of light and effervescent, but I mean, I can't imagine. I don't think she's in any danger of winning the Olympics, but like, or even making the final. But it was just kind of a nice addition to the lineup. Now, I was interesting watching the men and Camden Polkett in here. So, it's so interesting because he's from Arizona, like Max, and now he's with Tom Z, like Max is. But he also worked with Tom Dixon, and they've. That's clearly more of an attention to music with him. He's working with Tom Dixon. He's working with Lombiel. Tom Dixon mm -hmm. yells at him to take his dance classes. But he has some Max qualities that maybe we thought were just with Max being a hockey player. But he has some of Max's lesser qualities that it looks like maybe it was um, the Doug, being with Doug LeDre. And how he just, even the air position on the jumps is very Max Aaron. And some yeah. of the sloppiness in the combinations when they hold the edge too long and it looks real wonky with the upper body. Maybe that is a Doug LeDre thing that they learned in Arizona. Some of it. Yeah. Have, um, but it looks like a more refined, but it looks like he's constantly fighting his inner Max Aaron. Like he's fighting <laughs> just that like inner um, desire, but really lovely upper body musical in the short and in the free to West Side story, which Tom did long to the short. I thought it was a good skating here. And he said that when it was a good read, it was a good read on the um, West Side story. I thought, yeah. He said that listening to the music helps him relax during competition. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Duh. Well, and also in the, I think it was the short program. Uh, um, what, what was the non-West Side Story music? I'm forgetting. What was the short? I mean, it was generic loveliness. Uh, yeah, it was, it was like a lovely kind of thing. But he, he stood there and took his times. And you saw he had like these real wide, intense eyes. Um, and he just took... Sometimes you clearly see, like, if the Russian junior girls or something were told to, like, wait and ease into the program after a couple seconds, you can tell they're clearly like, can I go yet? Can I go yet? And Camden kind of took a moment, and you kind of saw centering happen. 
yeah. and you actually saw like, wow, that's what that moment can actually provide for a skater if they choose to let it. And because he came out, and I felt like the energy was a little like, oh god. And then he just, the music started. He listened. The shoulders went down. He engaged, and then started. And I was like, that's how brilliant of a tool that can be if it's used properly. It was it was really nice to see, and it focused us also. Yeah. But like the music starts and we're staring at his face. We're settling in. We're getting ready for the journey. You know, fantastic triple axel as well. Really, really mm-hmm. good. Um, it was interesting because Conrad Orsel won the short. He's moved to Orser and Lee Barkel. Interesting note here, I thought with him is that he looks like a young matinee idol. Like he just looks like a young talent. He really does. He really, really does. And they gave him Sean Mendez, um, which is a very contemporary singer. Um, so they're, you know, they're being, they're moving skating forward, right? Like making it a little bit uh, more relatable. And he has a nice costume on, a nice triple axel, but he doesn't use the music ever because he's so freaking nervous. And you could tell that he is just like very uptight in competition, even though he was, and he, in the long, he landed a, he went for quad sal and then he pops the triple axel, and you could just see that his takeoffs were the problem on everything because he was just not mind, body, connection, nervous, rigid. And to me, I, to me, I understood him and understood where he was at in the journey a little bit. I was like, I see you. You're so talented, cute kid. You know what I mean? Like, you know, all this stuff is going well for him, and you see the limitations. And to me, they are limitations of experience. Well, Not he's necessarily. Been to worlds twice, but bombed both times. So they clearly have to address whatever they. But do. how old is he still? He's like he's eighteen or so. so oh, I see, I see. Okay, well then I'm, I'm changing. It was a little bit, but like I kept thinking Tim Delensky was like seventeen and he was like twenty four, and I was like he'll figure it out, and then I was like oh god. Well, <laughs> man, it's time to figure it out. So this is yeah. really clearly the year they need to figure out whether it's a sports, you know, performance coach and choreographer and whatever is going to make him kind of tick. It's the right. time because he has the talent and he really right. has a lot of nice qualities. He needs right. to learn to use the music and really, because the Josh Groban, it just, be, I, the, I felt that the free skate to Romeo and Juliet is another one with too many pieces, but it just is so beige, you know, yeah. because he's not using it and he's skating through it. And it's like, deer in headlights. I mean, I just, it it seems such an, it's a a disservice to everyone to not pick something that excites that skater every time it turns on. I think he was just probably so nervous that he was in first at Junior Grand Prix and had the potential to win. And his, you know, training mate won last week. And subsequently knocked himself off the podium even. So, so now we've got some, it seems unlikely we'll ever see him at the final, you know. Well, he finished fourth here. So if he were to win his next event, he could, but, but that, that puts, puts pressure, pressure on winning, winning. Yes. you see. And, the, and I feel like for someone like this, that, that may not make for an easier learning change. experience. You know, yeah, that's exactly. That's exactly. Exactly. I thought Koshiro Shimada was lovely, skated to Adios, had some nice qualities, but I'm not sure on the X factor there. And it was a bit, um, as we talk about body types in the jumps, like at first when they were showing him torso up, I was like, oh, this is that lilty. Um, Hanyu Boyanjin kind of frame. And then as we came out, I was like, oh, but he's got some Adam Rippon curves going on as well, which I only notice is how that will aerodynamically change their approach to certain jumps. But um, yeah, talented, but um, I may not go out of my way to seek him next time. Where I really, I know this sounds goofy, I really do like watching Roman, the Russian guy who was there. Uh, limitations, obviously, and a super weird jump technique. I so, don't understand that to save my the life. The jump technique is so interesting because he's in a in a proper position for almost every single jump. He he starts like he's where he's supposed to be, and then he like gets weirdly aggressive. Flails, like, right yeah, yeah. Like, he'll be where he's supposed to be, and just and then he, he like crunches in to get the jump on almost every single jump, especially the pick jumps. But you see it on the axle too. It was the axle was the one that had me. It was like gasping. Like I literally would sit back in my chair as the takeoff happened and be like, ah. He's <laughs> what was that? aggressive and anxious on these. Yeah. Jump tech- yeah. And of course, you know. And then I was like, ooh, rock too. This will be. Oh, it's like a weird synthesized like elevator music version. But there's something about his skating. And I thought this last week also in Bratislava, like. 
there's something about it. Like, even if it's not going well and even if it's flawed, it's like a guilty pleasure. There's, I, I enjoy what he does. Not unlike, you know, this um, little thing I'm wearing. You know, I bought it off of uh, <laughs> the internet and I saw it and I was like, oh, it's, it looks so interesting in person. It's very Vera Wang for Nathan Chen. You know, it's actually navy blue. It probably looks black, but, you know, it looks a little like I'm a Catholic priest and maybe... Um, Maybe. Or maybe your Moonlight Sonata with um, it's Koch and Sergei. It's <laughs> my version of um, The Show Must Go On, apparently, for this week. But I just think with everything going on in the Catholic Church, maybe not the appropriate choice for this week. But it's Well, the, the, the competition, competition was in Linz. It was not in Pittsburgh, so <laughs> we're doing okay. Now, of course, I laugh because Linz... Austria, I mean, I primarily know now, of course, is the site of Costa Naya's big debut on the Grand Prix series this year. Um, but that's Hitler's hometown where he wanted to build that huge art mecca. Like, that, it's literally like they're still trying to probably shape that reputation. So they're trying to have more junior Grand Prix events there. But um, there is something inherently... I love this YouTube channel that ISU has for it. It, got, it itemized everything. This is great. They are making it easy for us to follow. Except for and one thing key. this year. What? The screen grab, Emmett. Emmett. They actually, they instead of just letting the video automatically find an image from the skating, uh -huh. they have like a random blank screen of like, it's just like a title. They put a title card on every one of their name rather than just seeing it. And it looks really strange. It actually looks like one of those videos where, like, you search someone's name and it looks like it's going to be something to watch, and then it's fake. It's a weird thing. Just oh, like, yeah, yeah, like, like the, the, the thumbnail, thumbnail of it is yeah, just like thumbnail is weird. And it they had appropriate thumbnails last year, and it really bugs. Oh, interesting. interesting. To me, it was just like quick lines, like. But yeah, it, it almost looks like when Ice Network used to do those for the um, the teleconferences. Like you think it's gonna you're gonna listen to a phone interview instead of watch the skating. Yeah. Yeah. And also, they, I mean, again, it, the camera views are a little gritty. You see all of the, you know, the mist off the ice. And then they, even at the, I know this sounds trite, but the Junior Grand Prix, especially now, is a highly competitive, like, highly respectable thing. But yet, like, if you looked around the baseboards, they were, like, unfinished. And it just, it, I don't know, there wasn't much um, care given to the presentation of what's a really high level competition. Yet no one's in attendance unless it's yeah. Japan. So, yeah. You know, I would love to go to Austria. So if they want to send me to Linz, I will go. I will um, visit the, the site of the potential Fur museum. museum. <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness! But you know, you just had to bring up the Hitler thing because I went to um, I went to uh, where, where is this going? going? <laughs> and my friend Abby moved to um, Germany, and my other friend Dustin who's Jewish, kept being like, how could you move there? I can't visit you there. And it was like six hours of like, well, does it smell like ovens there? And I was like, okay. Wow. He lives <laughs> in Germany and you're Jewish. And there's like an yeah. inherent mismatch. And I understand your feelings. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a from my time living, this is so off topic now, from my, my time living there, there's, there's still a great deal of guilt carried around there. Yes, well. Yeah. Deserve, it's, but, it's, um, a it's a thing. But in any case, but the fact that they chose Linz. Now, they're still going to do the Junior Grand Prix Final at the same time they do the Senior Grand Prix Final, correct? Yeah, which is like a weird... Thing. It's funny that they're all happening now because then it just leaves this huge, massive gap. And it's completely in the peaking schedule. Like, you could be... You have to be great and, like... And then literally go down for a long time. Almost, yeah, it seems so unusual. Think about it. You have to be up for Labor Day and then really try to be peaking again for like Around Christmas. Christmas. And yeah. then again towards like spring break. So right. yeah. it's very weird for these. There are three kind of surges. So actually like Roman, who was doing Bratislava then and then went right to Linz, you were kind of like, well, actually it kind of makes sense. Get that moment. I mean, I don't think he's, gonna, he's a third and a fourth, right? Because I think he was fourth in Bratislava, so he won't be in the finals probably anyway. Um, but, um, yeah, I would just think that kind of up and down is just not so now. Cause you, when they were talking about combining junior and senior worlds, it was kind of like a normal consensus that no one's interested in that. But would you think they would ever do that for the Grand Prix? I don't know. I don't 
who knows? I mean, I know part of what I like about Skate America is we're usually watching six or eight skaters in each discipline, like really in a concentrated manner. I think that's a lot in a long yeah. time. And who's yeah. going to take off of work to go to a Skate America to watch a junior Grand Prix? Like, it's just a weird thing. If right. they can do it economically, let it. I like going to the small countries and. Okay. It lets people have their moment, you know. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. That makes sense. It was just the time, the the trajectory of the time. I don't understand how they would ever do it with the practice schedules and everything, because some of these junior grand prix events go on for six hours. So we really let everyone compete. (laughs) How long? (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Well, it's been another lovely week. And um, in the name of the Father and the Son and the um, the Holy Ghost, oh hold an edge. And- <laughs>